All right, guys, we are just waiting for our guest to come on. Um, I am Rhonda Holman. I think I'll say this again in just a moment <laughs> as I wait for a few more of you to jump on. I'm so eager to get this information out and I'm super excited uh, that you guys are all here. I'm Rhonda Holman. <laughs> I'm the wing woman to Jules Varney, uh, the host of DA Rockstar's podcast and um, a 20 plus year dental assistant. So uh, bear with me as I am new to the webcast world webinar <laughs> and I will try and make sure that I did my best to get you guys the best information possible. We will be going live at one Eastern time. If you guys want to take this opportunity, if you have any questions specifically that you'd like to ask, um, you guys can go ahead and tap, type those in. And we'll try and get to them before the, the webinar is over. Okay, so Jules wants me to explain briefly why she is not uh, hosting today's webinar. Um, unfortunately, she has a side hustle gig, so she works at a um, like a craft shop. And unfortunately, you know, people are bad. Somebody broke in and she's trying to deal with that right now. And um, so she sends her sincerest apologies that she can't be here with us. But um, clearly, you know, some people are taking advantage of this downtime and where businesses aren't um, being occupied. So they're going in and doing bad things. So it makes me sad, but um, I know Jules is the right person to take care of it. <laughs> she can handle anything. All right, we are just waiting for our guest.
I feel like I want to play you guys some music. No, not elevator music, but like decent music. Um, but I don't actually have music on my phone. <laughs> I can hum. I'm a good hummer. <laughs> I probably should do that. Okay. I'm so excited. Uh, there's a lot of information that we've been overloaded with uh, as it comes down to proper PPE and what COVID means to dental assistants and how it's affecting the dental industry. And to have an expert come on and give us the details, like true black and white, no gray areas, I think is going to be extremely beneficial to all of us. Look at all you eager beavers. We're up to 41 attendees so far. I'm so excited. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, my practice hasn't had a lot of emergency treatments um, or needs, I guess. And my doctor, it was funny because I asked her, I said, how often do you think we'll be coming in for emergency treatment? And she says, well, we take such good care of our patients that it probably will be minimum. And it was. So far, I think we've done like one day a week. Um, where we average about three patients. So I did actually get a Saturday call, uh, which never happened when we were running at normal capacity. Um, but for pain, swelling, and infection, I'm like, oh, yes, we'll come in. And it was funny because I, you know, I had to explain it to my other assistant who came in with me because we had to plug back in the CBCT and I was afraid that the software updated. And I said, I'm so sorry that I'm calling you in on a Saturday. And uh, she's like, there are no such things of days of the week anymore. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, well, thanks for understanding. <laughs> Hi, guys. Welcome to the webinar. We're waiting on our guest, um, and we should be starting promptly at 1. So super excited about that. Thanks for being early. <laughs> My husband says, if you're early, you're on time. So uh, I've tried to live by that. It's really challenging as a girl, because we have to put all the war paint on and, and do our locks. <laughs> I'm just going to gab a little bit because I'm used to interacting with someone and you guys are just watching me until <laughs> Miss India gets here. <laughs> Oh, Jules is your office manager. How neat. How uh, she's a rock star, right? Oh, I've never met that, that a single person that is so good at so many different things. <laughs> she's like, like a dental assistant on steroids <laughs> where she literally knows almost everything. I mean, after the amount of years, oh, well, hello, Miss India. How Hi, are you? How are you? We're so excited. I've just been chatting with these uh, lovely attendees um, and, nice. uh, and, and nice. we're super excited to have you on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to be here. I follow you guys. So I've been, you know, watching everything going on. So I'm excited. And I uh, hear like, we have a full house. <laughs> so far, yes. Uh, we have a lot of uh, attendees so far. I'm going to get us a count here mm -hmm. in just a moment. We're at 58. So a lot okay, of um, nice. eager participants ready to learn. Yes. And India, I want to start this <laughs> off by, by, let's just find out a little bit more about you. Let's, uh, you know, your background okay. and maybe what brought you to this place in the world in life where you're on this webinar today. <laughs> Got it. Uh, so my name's India Chance. I am a dental hygienist. I have been in dentistry 
I'm going to date myself now. Um, I'm on my 26th year. Uh, I didn't start out in dentistry as a dental hygienist. I started out as a dental assistant. That was my very first position. I was an endo uh, assistant, right? Exactly, right? So um, I learned the ropes very quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and then I transitioned. I went to dental hygiene school. Uh, I did a lot of public health work and uh, just had a passion for infection control and, you know, compliance. And then um, about, well, yeah, three years ago in 2017, I started a company called Learn to Prevent, and we are a compliance company. We focus on supporting dental teams and practice owners to adhere to, you know, the current guidelines and recommendations, uh, you know, put forth by the CDC and OSHA, as well as supporting them and helping them implement uh, safety programs and protocols within the practice. We do mock inspections. Uh, we provide uh, you know, on-site training, so team-wide training. Uh, we have CE courses, and we also have um, uh, an online academy for, you know, compliance courses. So, you know, I just got really passionate about it, and uh, I got mentored by someone who retired about two years ago. She was a dentist in my area, and this is what she did. And so she mentored me a little bit. And so here I am. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so but did you always have like a fascination for like microbiology? Like, I, I always think about the scientists behind all of this. <laughs> Anything infection um, control. <laughs> no. Not so much the microbiology. I've always been a rule follower since I was a kid. I had an older brother who I used to get on his nerves all the time because I was always like, we have to follow the rules. We have to follow the rules, you know? And so I was very legalistic when I was young and stuff like that, you know? And so I have been really fascinated in learning. Uh, of course, we had to take microbiology, you know, to become a dental hygienist and everything. But um, I'm really into like researching and reading all of the information and knowing what, you know, mandates are there and, you know, really being able to interpret those because sometimes this information that we're going to talk about can be overwhelming in the infection control space. <laughs> there's so many <laughs> rules, there's so many guidelines, who do we pay attention to, you know, and stuff. And so we've seen that with this whole pandemic situation. So uh, that's kind of, that's just me in a nutshell. But yeah, no, I love the science behind it too. I think it is really cool and fascinating to learn all about, you know, new things happening, you know, new diseases. And of course, this new virus that's here, you know, it's been interesting learning from a lot of people since we've had this time at home. So yeah. 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 You know, uh, uh, okay. Before I jump into some of the questions that we have for you, mm -hmm. I, sure. I do want to know, okay, so when was the last neurovirus? Neuro being new, right? Meaning, what was the last one that affected the dental field, or, or I guess all of us, so, but specifically well, dentistry? All of, yeah, all of them really. Um, you know, <laughs> dentistry sometimes gets left out um, in the cold when it comes to some of these things, and we've seen that a little bit with this particular um, virus. And uh, I would probably assume. Um, the last one that we had, you know, MERS or, and then there was SARS. So there's been a couple, you know, uh, since I've been in dentistry, this is, I think the third one that we've dealt with. And so, um, personally, because we're healthcare providers, I think it's very important that we remember that all infectious diseases affect us because we deliver patient care and it's not just patient care uh, like some of the primary care doctors deliver where there's no kind of interaction with anybody physically. There's just more conversation happening in some medical uh, visits. But in our, you know, the procedures that we provide, we actually uh, perform procedures on patients. And I was going to chat about that. You know, these procedures um, produce aerosols, batter, droplets. And so, just from my experience and my knowledge, I think all infectious diseases affect us. <laughs> well, you know, you know like um, what we're taught in school is you treat everyone as if they have every single disease known to mankind. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly how we need to really approach this. Um, 
This is a little bit of a caveat because we don't really have any mandates uh, that have been provided by OSHA. And so let me just back up a little bit. CDC makes recommendations, which are just that. They're just recommendations. Now, if you work in a state or you practice in a state where your dental board or your health department acknowledges and accepts the CDC guidelines and they adhere to those, uh, some states have them written into their Dental Practice Act and then some states adhere to them if there's a patient complaint and an inspection is warranted, then they utilize the CDC recommendations to, to guide the inspection. And so in those particular states, then your CDC recommendations hold a lot more weight. And most of the time in those situations, the recommendations actually become law. Uh, OSHA is an actual legal entity. And so whatever they say, it's a law and we have to abide by it and they have mandates they can do random inspections, they can show up whenever they want. And so OSHA doesn't really have a mandate in place for infectious disease. We do have the bloodborne pathogen standard, but that just deals with uh, pathogens that are transmitted through a bloodborne route. You know, if a needle stick or a puncture with a sharp instrument, we don't have anything on the books to protect us for this type of virus, you know, or any of the other viruses. So, uh, that's, you know, it, it's already started and we can get into that in a little bit, but OSHA is definitely coming with some new information. I, I imagine, it's yeah, coming. well, all the, the, I mean, there's a ton of people on here right now that probably have said, oh, well, we probably didn't do it the right way before and right. we got by with it, but right. I don't right. see that being yeah. part of our future. There, there is no halfway no, anymore. No, no. Right. And that's why OSHA is actually in the process of creating a mandate for infectious, uh, well, a rule, they call it, uh, for infectious diseases. They've already started the initial phases. Uh, they did submit to Congress for a temporary, um, and uh, I had it written down because I wanted to share with the language. It's a... Um, a temporary standard that requires certain employers to develop and implement an infectious disease exposure plan to protect employees uh, that are in healthcare sectors where we would be at risk to uh, contract the current virus. And so it's a temporary standard, but they've already begun the process to make a rule. Now, I don't know when that's going to happen and when they're going to implement that, but it's coming down the pike. Um, there's a lot of things that they have to do at the legislative level and different uh, protocols that they have to go through from a federal standpoint in order to get a rule. They have to show that there's a risk out there to employees. They have to show that um, they look at different industries such as the dental industry and they have to see how uh, economically feasible it is to implement like an entire rule, if they were to put together like a whole big rule, like the bloodborne pathogen standard, could we sustain it as an industry if there was things that they requested like more PPE? You know, could the small business owner be able to afford those type of things? And then they, um, but they look at that as a whole. They don't look at it like as individual business owners. They just look at dentistry and say, could dentistry afford to implement this? And then they look at feasibility, like, how realistic is it or how feasible is it to implement it in every single place that delivers dental health care. So there's a lot of things they have to prove like through science. And now since the previous um, coronaviruses that were that we had like SARS and MERS, um, there's a lot of more, you know, a lot more science that has been done. And so now they're able to look at science from previous incidents and and say, okay, there is reasonable cause for us to implement an actual standard. The reason being is because what they've found, um, one, there's no national kind of um, monitoring system to monitor all different aspects of healthcare. So for instance, in dentistry, we don't really, if you're a small business owner and you work in a small practice, privately owned, there's really nobody that's overseeing you per se. Um, as far as on a daily basis or with random inspections, you know, all inspections happen 
for the most part in most states. There's some that have, some states have random inspections from the dental board or the health department into dental practices, but for the most part, most dental, most states um, have what we call um, complaint initiated. So you have to submit a complaint, whether a patient or employee would have, or a dental practice owner would self-report, and then an inspection would happen. And so because of that, we're kind of loosely monitored in dentistry. And so there's not a lot of data that can be attributed specifically to dentistry. And so that's why you'll see some of the CDC recommendations they make they they take they pull data from like hospital settings that are regulated and then they just assume and come up with you know they come up with a formula and they um make you know they create data on what they assume might be happening for injuries in our in our uh industry so for instance like they have data that shows that on an annual basis there's 385,000 needle stick injuries that happen in in healthcare or hospital settings uh, they assume that out of that 385, based on some formula that they created, that 115,000 happen in dental practices. But they're not sure because we're not closely monitored. So it's the same thing with infectious disease. We don't know how many infectious diseases are actually, you know, beginning in the dental office, but maybe they incubate and they manifest at a later time. We just don't have the data for that. So that's why OSHA is trying to push having a mandate because what they want to do, they also found that because there's no mandates, that some employers aren't adhering the way that they are supposed to. And so OSHA feels like in order to reduce the risk of um, uh, healthcare acquired infections or hospital acquired infections, HAIs, that they feel like a mandate which would be a law, would reduce that risk. And, and that is true. You know, I'm a compliance consultant. I go into dental practices. And for those practices that aren't as strong in infection prevention or they aren't as strong in OSHA, you know, implementing OSHA standards, uh, you do see a trend where they are more likely to follow what OSHA is saying uh, versus, you know, what the CDC is recommending. And so you, you do see that between you know different offices so i can understand why osha wants to put a law <laughs> in yeah. place to protect us mm -hmm. yeah no yeah, that's gonna okay sure. so for sure let's say someone yeah. on this uh webinar currently like, has mm -hmm. been living under a rock and doesn't <laughs> understand what COVID is let's just go over a brief overview of what the virus actually is what it looks like and and a little bit more about it like how exactly is it transmitted what can we do Got we'll it. go into some more questions about that but okay what is COVID nineteen? So COVID, so coronaviruses are a large family, okay? It's a large family of viruses that are transmitted between people and also animals. And the current strain that we have, it's a new strain, that's why there's no vaccine yet, okay? Uh, it is transmitted, we found, through, you know, people as well as animals. And apparently, I've had some saw some research where uh, the feline species happens to be able to, I guess, get it from us. Um, and because of our like DNA is similar to theirs or something like that. So it has something to do with a DNA level, um, not to get too technical on everybody. And then um, basically at the beginning, they, you know, the, the WHO, World Health Organization and CDC, was saying that it spread through droplets, you know, spatter from uh, coughing and sneezing. And so, therefore, that's why, you know, now everybody has to wear the masks and, you know, when you're going out in public and that kind of thing. How that relates to dentistry is they are finding that um, pretty much most of the procedures that we provide to patients, what they do is they actually aerosolize those droplets and those procedures. And then somebody who could be asymptomatic, um, or maybe they have it and they have symptoms, but they don't, they haven't been tested and they don't think that they have COVID because they're just thinking that it's a common cold because coronavirus can uh, present as like a common cold up to like severe diseases like what we have now, the COVID-19. And so that's why some people who have it 
don't know that they have it because they think they just have like a common cold or the flu. And we all learned all that, a lot of that in the beginning. And so the problem with aerosolizing the splatter and stuff like that is that it stays in the air and then we inhale it, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, when we take our masks off. Um, the other thing is anything that's not aerosolized, it's a droplet, it will fall onto surfaces that we touch barehanded. And then if we're touching our faces, our nose, you know, we're going like this, or, you know, we're touching our eyes or, you know, our mouths or whatever, you know, uh, that's how it spreads. And it can last on surfaces for long periods of time. Uh, the biggest concern is that now they're finding that a lot of people are asymptomatic. And so, we could see a dental patient today and then tomorrow the symptoms could start, but they could have had the virus three days ago or yeah. five days, whatever. Um, it all depends on their immune system, their health history, you know, what's going on with them. So it's ever changing, you know, people are, you know, the CDC and who they've gotten a lot of, uh, um, flack. All of the organizations have gotten a lot of flack, but unfortunately this is a virus. It's a living thing. <laughs> you know, we don't know what it's going to, you know, this, we don't have a playbook for this, really. We're kind of writing the playbook as we go. So if this ever happens again, now we know what to do. And so it's kind of, I kind of relate it to those who have children. When you have your first child, you have no clue, like, what's going to happen, what's coming the first time you're pregnant, like, you know, or if you're a dad and, you know, this, you're a first time dad, like, you have no idea what's going to happen. You kind of are learning as you go along. The second, the third, the fourth, and the so on children, they get a better version of you because you kind of know what to expect. You already have written the playbook, right? Yep. And so that's kind of what's going on. You know, we, we don't know. Even though we've had coronaviruses in the past, um, it's been different or they've been more isolated to certain countries like Ebola was isolated. You know, there's different... Um, uh, uh, like tuberculosis, um, actually tuberculosis, they've had um, rules, well, they've proposed a rule since the 90s. There's been like, you know, um, guidelines since the 90s for that. But tuberculosis manifests a different, a little bit different. And we personally in the dental office wouldn't see someone with active tuberculosis because they probably wouldn't even be able to come in, you know, just because of how the disease progresses. So that's it in a nutshell, kind of how we transmit it. And then the concern for dental professionals um, or healthcare providers. I have to, I'm starting to correct myself. We are healthcare providers, not yeah. dental professionals, right? <laughs> and so, and so that's the concern that this splatter and spatter can be aerosolized. And let me just say this because I've been in a lot of groups and a lot of the, um, because all of the information that came out in the beginning said, oh, it's spatter and that's how it's, it's droplet. Um, transmitted and things like that. I, um, the CDC actually wrote, and let me just um, say this, that this is quote from the CDC that um, the World Health Organization stated that, this was on the CDC website, but World Health Organization stated this, that airborne transmission may be possible in specific settings in which procedures that generate aerosols are performed. So they're the ones that are saying with all the CDC data and everything that these droplets, once they're aerosolized, stay in the air. And then we as dental care professionals who are performing these procedures, aerosol generating procedures, can actually contract the, you know, COVID-19. And so that's why there's this concern for us to make sure we're protected if we're going to be going back to work soon, which apparently a lot of states are starting to reopen, right? Right. So speaking of protection, yeah. um, we have a couple mm -hmm. questions coming in, but I, I want to talk about sure. that specifically for the healthcare providers that focus on the mouth. <laughs> right. Exactly. What, do we, what are the standards for protection for us? Right. So the CDC has given interim guidelines that we need to be following. So it really starts before the patient comes to the office. So um, I will put a caveat out there. I'm going to talk about different personal protective equipment. And if you don't have this, the CDC is saying don't treat patients. Um, they have not changed the CDC. I'm talking about the CDC now. They have not changed their recommendation about treating um, non-emergency patients. They're still 
they are still recommending that we should only be treating uh, emergency patients. I know ADA and other organizations have uh, put out information. Um, professional organizations like ADA and ADHA, and if you guys have um, uh, like a dental assistant professional organization, uh, those are just that. They're just professional industry organizations. They don't make scientific recommendations. They can't make laws. So they have to really adhere to what the legal and entities and then the government organizations such as CDC are recommending. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. Now, um, the CDC interim guidelines, they were updated April 8th, and what they are saying is that you need to um, postpone any non-urgent care, okay? Then they're saying that you need to pre-screen your patients before they come. So you're going to triage, telephone triage is what they're calling it. So you're going to ask them, you know, have you had certain um, uh, symptoms? And you're going to go down the list of symptoms, and that's all listed on the CDC. So everybody can go there to find that out. And if they say no, you know, no fever, I haven't traveled, you know, all, they answer all of those correct uh, questions correctly, then they would come into the office. It is being recommended by them that you then do another type of triage where, because maybe you do your confirmation calls the day before or you do them two days before. And so remember what we said about asymptomatic, you know, people who have COVID, they might not have had anything the day before, but the day that they present to your office, they might be running a fever or something like that. So it is recommended you take a fever and you ask them all those questions again. Um, there should be social distancing still needs to be observed. So some of my clients, what they were doing is they were having um, car concierge type of deal. And so what that means is when you arrive to the office, you call the office and you say, hey, I'm here, you wait in your car. And then once your appointment time and is here and then the dentist and, you know, um, or dental hygienist is ready to receive you, then you go right into your uh, operatory where you're going to be treated. You don't wait in the reception area. They're also recommending that um, uh, administrative team members uh, email receipts and treatment plans so you're not having any type of contact. Uh, it's a good idea for your administri administrative team members to be wearing masks if they're going to be, you know, um, working. And then once the patient is received, then they're talking about, uh, again, like I just said, going over all of the health history. As far as your personal protective equipment, there are some things happening because we're having um, per, uh, shortages with PPE now. And so, um, and I just wrote some stuff down because I want to get the language uh, correct. And so, what they're saying, the CDC is recommending use the highest level of PPE possible. Okay, and so the highest level would be gowns or uh, lab coats or jackets, uh, gloves, of course, protective eyewear, and then an N95 or higher mask. Now, I say that, and we all know that there are shortages and some offices can't get them. And so uh, OSHA has even said this, along with the CDC, that if you can't get an N95 or higher respirator mask, then uh, the next best or the next level that you should go to would be a level three surgical mask, your protective eyewear, and then a full face shield. So as well as, you know, your gown and your gloves, of course. Um, and so you want to... India, what about a hairnet, hair cap? Yes, you, they didn't mention that, but that's probably a good idea uh, just because we all know that splatter. I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of... Um, of my colleagues have worn those for years because as dental hygienists, there's like, we always have, you know, profi paste Other people's parts of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then for dental assistants, sometimes you guys are closer to the patient than the dentist. So, you know, so um, that's definitely something that you guys should implement. Of course. Um, I know a lot of in the hygiene uh, space and a lot of the dentists that I know, they're going to start wearing, you know, caps and surgical caps for their hair and their head and to protect their skin and all of that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. You know, suit up as, as much as you can because you just never know. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So we actually, I have a couple of questions, but one sure. is pertinent to right now. Okay. So um, Sally wants to know, change all of these between patients. So Okay. Do we have to have several sets of the garments, the whole setup, or, I mean, how does that, how does that look? 
Okay, so the problem is we're in a period of shortage. So there are interim guidelines that the CDC is recommending only during the pandemic because we have shortages. One, if we are still in the pandemic, but the PPE shortages stop, then we have to go back to our regular guidelines. Meaning if you are wearing anything disposable, it's you got to go back to one use only. And, you know, for instance, I'll go, I'll, I'll, I will address each piece of PPE. So uh, we know most of the time goggles or protective eyewear is reusable. So th that you would disinfect between each patient like you've always done. Uh, some people have the face shields that are plastic. Uh, so you can disinfect those like you've always done. The reusable ones, the ones that you kind of pull off of the headband or they're attached to a mask, those in the past have been single use only disposable. There are some caveats now with PPE shortage that CDC has recommended. OSHA has not said this, but CDC has recommended that if obviously if you can't get more, then what you are supposed to do is you are, if you're wearing a mask and let's say you only have one N95 mask, right? Um, when you remove it, you are supposed to do it in a way where you're not going to contaminate the mask in any way. So you, during a procedure, if you know you've had this mask on for two or three patients, you shouldn't keep, you know, touch the mask or anything. It should be fitting properly when you start. Surgical masks, same thing, you know, make sure you smooth the nose bar down and then you just are gonna wear it. You're not gonna take it off. I know that sounds odd to us because we are not used to that, but it's, this is just during the pandemic. I have to stress that. Um, if you must take off the mask or touch it, you are supposed to perform hand hygiene, remove the mask, put it in a sealed like bag or container, and then perform hand hygiene again. And then go to lunch or do whatever you're going to do. When you come back, perform hand hygiene, put it on, and then perform hand hygiene again. That's what you do if you're in a shortage. That's for a mask. Um, for your um, gowns, they are recommending that people transition to cloth uh, jackets, reusable cloth jackets and gowns because sometimes the disposable gowns, especially if there's a shortage and you don't have enough to change after each patient throughout the day, some of those gowns, uh, disposable gowns use string, and if you pull them off, it'll break the string and then it's, you can't wear it properly again. So if you're in an office where you have like the, um, those surgical disposable gowns, CDC is recommending that it's only changed if visibly soiled. So obviously if there's clear like blood or anything like that on there, then you change it. Once the pandemic is over, then we go back to single use only and you change it in between patients. Um, uh, for your cloth uh, reusable uh, jackets or gowns or lab coats, they're recommending on-site laundry or third-party laundry, laundering. Um, and so, and then if you're dealing, like let's say you have to deal with the on-site laundry that's part of your duty then you need to wear proper protective equipment but again that should be that should have happened before the pandemic if your job is to you know do the laundering of the contaminated PPE then you should always have your personal protective equipment on you know your mask and your eyewear and your gloves when you're dealing with contaminated um, laundry and so but that's why they're they're recommending transitioning to uh, reusable jackets um, I am saying in addition to all of that, personally, I would recommend just because of what I know about compliance and spread of infection, I would recommend that you guys come to work in your street clothes. And if you, if you are responsible for laundering your scrub top and, and pants at home, then you put them in a sealed bag, you take them home and then you wash them by themselves with bleach, hot water, and um, that's the only thing that goes in there. If you wanna go one step further, run a whole nother cycle with just bleach and water with no clothes in there and clean your, you know, clean your washing machine. Um, color safe bleach, right guys? <laughs> what'd color you say? Safe. Color yes, safe color, bleach. color safe bleach, right. Follow the manufacturer. <laughs> I'm sure India was getting ready to say that, but you don't wanna like turn <laughs> all your black scrubs. Right, 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 color safe bleach. <laughs> 
and then um and then uh have leave your shoes either at the office that you wear in the treatment area leave those at the office or leave them in the car maybe you're a temp or you work at a couple different offices and so leave your shoes um leave your reusable glasses or goggles whatever you use you know have them in a in a closed sealed container and leave that stuff in your car um, anything you use in the clinical area that you take home with um, the doctors are only required by law to provide you with a mask gloves uh, your outermost layer which is your uh, your scrub top or your jacket I'm sorry your scrub jacket your lab coat or your disposable jackets uh, and did I say eyewear? That's it. They are not responsible to purchase a surgical cap for you unless they make it mandatory. If they make okay. anything mandatory, they have to provide it. But OSHA says they don't, you know, it doesn't include a surgical cap and it doesn't include like shoes or shoe covers or anything like that. And it doesn't include a scrub top or scrub pants. Um, I'm recommending that you try to get a longer lab coat for yourself because when you're sitting if you are an assistant that sits then all of that splatter kind of falls you know on the top the trajectory of, of your it. thighs yeah. and yes exactly um personally for me i stand and so that's not really an issue because my patients come you know at a certain level above my waist but um for those that sit it is being recommended that you wear a long lab coat so a couple caveats and so I would say the best thing for you to do everybody on here on the line is to visit CDC COVID-19 and they have everything kind of listed out per piece of P excuse me per piece of PPE that's a lot of P's right there um, <laughs> uh, and it gives you guidelines for each thing and what you do during a pandemic and it's very self-explanatory you know a lot of information but it breaks it down which is nice per piece of equipment and so it also talks about the N95s and how you would utilize those during a shortage so mm -hmm. oh. That's really I good. hope that so, all answers the question. I know. I, I think a lot of us, you know, we're getting mixed signals between yeah. our doctors and say we're on social yeah. media and these groups yeah. are saying oh, yeah. this, this, and this. So I know. I, another question we have, mm -hmm. I'm just going to mm -hmm. go through my list that Julie gave sure. me. First, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then I'm going to go through um, some of the viewers have some questions. But okay, so sounds good. what are the future changes coming specifically okay. in the dental realm? Like the way we use our operatories and and um, how we treat patients in those operatories so I'll start with the medical history that's probably going to change a lot some of you probably aren't used to doing a really in-depth type of uh, exploration into somebody's health history a lot of times offices will say have there been any health changes and the person responds no and then you just proceed you're going to probably see some changes in that area where more questions are going to be asked um, the dentist the dental hygienist or if you as a dental assistant are in charge of that portion of the visit you're going to need to be a little bit more in depth so we'll see changes there you probably will see changes obviously with our personal protective equipment maybe we're going to have to wear n95 and higher respirators because what you had mentioned in the very beginning that we have to treat everybody like they have every disease known to man and so now with this in new infectious disease that's affected everybody in such a way we will probably see changes higher levels of ppe will probably happen uh, you might see higher levels of ppe for certain procedures and other procedures you don't have to have higher levels just because of you know the aerosol generating procedures versus like let's say an exam or impressions it doesn't really produce a lot of splatter and all of that um, you will probably see um, changes in uh, external suction and high-speed evacuation suction because that is actually one of the interim uh, recommendations from the CDC that every patient now should have uh, high-speed evacuation being used and so if you are a dental assistant uh, they are recommending they specifically said that uh, if you are going to be treating patients during this time that you are supposed to use four-handed dentistry and your assistant should be using the HVE so uh, you'll 
probably see more mandates and standards regarding specific procedures. Because in the past, um, there's been a lot of times where you could just use the slow speed suction. You know, you don't have to necessarily use high speed evacuation, but you'll see changes there. Uh, again, the external suctions, you might see, I was just online and I saw an endo office that they actually have an external unit, uh, not like anything I've ever seen. It's this huge separate unit in this big, huge uh, evacuation um, kind of pipe thing. Um, there's also another company out of California. A lot of dentists have been purchasing uh, their product. It's an external suction and it actually goes above the patient's chest and it sits very close to their mouth and it's a high speed evacuation external suction that uh, apparently it suctions and removes and reduces all the aerosols. Um, you will probably also see it's a current interim recommendation but more use of dental dams to reduce you know aerosols and stuff like that so you'll probably see people implementing that and that will probably become part of the standard i'm, I'm assuming um and uh i'm trying to think of what else um because osha did submit just so everybody knows osha did submit a temporary order i think i might have mentioned this uh to congress it was submitted on march 9th and there it was submitted but they're still waiting for the house and you know senate to pass it but um what they want is that's like the first step to get an actual standard in place and so i would assume within the next six to 12 months, we will probably see an, an infectious disease rule or standard added to the annual OSHA required training that we have to have. And that rule will evolve just like the other rules have evolved as technology changes and as we get more science. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example, the ionizing radiation rule, that's kind of changed over the years because now we use digital, digital radiation. Yeah you know, I mean, digital technology. So that will change. Um, you will probably see longer appointment times because, you know, if you're having to ask patients about their health history, that takes a little bit longer. If you have to use certain equipment for certain types of procedures, it takes a little bit more time to set up and actually utilize those. So you might see more of that. Um, so actually, you, India, this, mm -hmm. this runs into a question. A okay. Question. Sure. Alexia, 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 mm -hmm. I can't. Um, how would you suggest an orthodontic office start seeing patients again? As far as patient load, ortho offices see numerous of patients a day and give the circumstance, giving the circumstances with social distancing. So, right. uh, I mean, I know most people have orthodontic offices that are kind of like this, right? It's just an right, open, bay. An open bay. You have chairs right. all mm -hmm. over the place. What mm -hmm. would you suggest for uh, practices that have that layout? So, unfortunately, um, our guidelines don't, because there's so many caveats in dentistry on how our offices are set up, these guidelines don't necessarily address open bays. Um, for orthodontic specifically, I know personally uh, that there are, I have a couple clients who are orthodontists, they're doing as much teledentistry as they can. And then for those patients that have to come in and be seen, you're going to follow the CDC guidelines. You're going to have the social distancing. So if you, let's say you're in a pedo office or an ortho office that has 10 chairs, then it's going to be every other chair that you fill. You're not going to, there's no more for you to have every single chair filled <laughs> unless your chairs are six feet apart. Okay. Uh, so it's going to be similar to, um, you know, uh, other industries where they have, you know, every other chair. Um, you're going to limit the amount of patients you see at one time. You're not going to have your reception areas filled, you know, especially most the average patient is children, you know, child, and they come in with the family and the brothers and sisters. You're going to have people wait in their cars, and then they're going to come in when you're ready. Um, you're going to have to adhere to just what I said about the personal protective equipment. You need to make sure that you're donning all of the personal protective equipment. Now, uh, I've never been an ortho assistant, but I've been through ortho treatment. My son has been through ortho treatment. You guys don't have a lot of 
aerosol producing procedures. So you guys are in a way in the best place you can be <laughs> regarding dentistry because you are doing more procedures that don't have a lot of spatter. They don't have a lot of, uh, you're not using the air water syringe a lot. You're not uh, aerosolizing anything. And so you guys are really uh, in the best possible place. Where you want to pay attention to is your, your, med your telephone triage, your medical health history triage when they first come in, you know, rechecking all of their symptoms taking their temperature, and then making sure that you have your personal protective equipment on and, um, you know, avoiding uh, paying attention to you must disinfect your disinfection protocols. The one thing is we in this during this time, we've put an awful lot of uh, emphasis on personal protective equipment. And if you look at the hierarchy of controls, personal protective equipment is at the very bottom. There's disinfection and sterilization is higher than that. You know, devices that you use, that's your engineering controls, it's higher than your PPE, your work uh, habits, your workplace controls, that's your habits. Like, are you making sure that you're delivering contaminated instruments properly to the sterilization area? Do you have a proper protocol? Are you wearing your, your utility gloves? Are you disinfecting? Are you using your disinfectants properly? That's going to be key. That is a higher control than your PPE to stop the spread of infection. Another higher control than PPE is hand hygiene. That's the number one way to prevent uh, any type of disease, the spread of infection. And it's been recommended for this whole pandemic. And so you can't wear PPE, but not perform hand hygiene between every patient and pr perform it properly. For those of you who have long nails and you like getting, you know, um, you like looking nice with all these nails, unfortunately, you're going to have to rethink that because you cannot have that. You shouldn't have had it in the past, but you're not supposed to have that moving forward. And I have a feeling they're definitely going to implement that in the infectious disease um, uh, standard because that is a way to uh, spread Harbor infection. bacteria. And you know, it's That's funny because it. I mean, you guys have gotten a chance to kind of get to the new normal being self-isolated yeah. <laughs> and you can't go to the salon. So like you had a chance to warm up right. and get ready to not right. have your bling. <laughs> right, right, right. No bling, you know, nothing hanging. You can't, I mean, the thing is with the long nails, you are not able to wear the gloves properly. The gloves don't properly fit. It, right. it they, they, the integrity of the gloves are not made to uh, cover nails and be extended like that you increase the risk of injury so yeah that that there uh, let me get back and just make one quick point about your disinfectants you have to read the manufacturer instructions when you are utilizing these disinfectants you have to pay attention to your signal words you have to pay attention to your kill times what i mean by that is if you have a disinfectant that states that it's supposed to be wet for two minutes in order to kill you know, um, to, to fulfill the claim. And most of our disinfectants already have a coronavirus claim on there. Uh, and, and also coronavirus is one of the weak, it's weak, it's very yeah. weak. It's not like our bacterial spores and all that kind of thing. But you still need to pay attention to the directions, uh, the manufacturer instructions for use, because if your surface is supposed to stay wet for two minutes in order to kill you know, that's why it's cidal, that means side, death, right? Your bacterial cidal, tuberculocidal, you know, coronavirus, anything like that, um, you have to leave the surface wet for two minutes. You also need to pay attention to if you're using the disinfectant wipes, are they one step or are they two steps? So sometimes you have disinfectant wipes, if you look at the label it'll say clean and it'll give you directions on how to use them to clean and that would be your first wipe and that's removing surface debris like a splatter or a piece of profi pay anything like that you know something visible or not visible you're wiping it that's a droplet right the next set of instructions are going to say disinfectant now not all labels are like this but there are a lot of of uh the disinfectant wipes that do that the next set of instructions are going to be for disinfectant that means a brand new wipe and now that second wipe, which is your second step, is your disinfectant wipe. And so that's going to go and disinfect the surface. And then you have to um, make sure that you are adhering to the instructions if it's two minutes, five minutes, whatever. Because sometimes the kill time changes from a cleaning uh, 
uh, product to a disinfectant product. Sometimes for the, it goes from two minutes to five minutes. So you need to pay attention to that. The yeah. other thing is your barriers. If you cannot disinfect a surface fully, then you are supposed to barrier it. All those keyboards, all those mice, those buttons, if you're using the light, you know, you can't properly disinfect the nooks and crannies. Let's say you are using air water syringe. You need to have a barrier over that because you can't clean around the buttons. Mm -hmm. um, you need to remove all anything that CDC put out a clarifying statement that anything that can be removed from the dental unit from air water, anything you're using, if it's a Cavitron uh, sleeve, if it's um, like a Sterimate, you know, some of those are removable. If it's a slow speed handpiece, high speed handpiece, anything that can be removed needs to be removed and sterilized. So the, the, the disinfecting and sterilization are higher controls than your PPE to stop the spread of infection. So I just, I want to put that out there because PPE is not the only thing. You have to do a whole approach in order to prevent the spread of infection. It's not just an N95 mask and changing your jacket between every patient. So just want to put that out there. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And, and here's another question. I know a lot of us work in operatories that have mouthwash and cups on the counter, or they have things that maybe aren't in the drawer, like some of our flowables that are in a display case. Talk yeah. to us about what we need to do to make our operatories right. Clean off the counters. Eliminate the clutter. Uh, a lot of these cups and those are disposable. Those should be in a cabinet, in a drawer, or Maybe you have them in another room in the clinical area and you grab it as you need it per patient, um, but you have to eliminate all the clutter. Uh, this was recommended way before pandemic. This is something that we should have been paying attention to for a long time. And I say that because I've gotten a lot of uh, questions and everything from people uh, regarding things that have been in place since 2003. Some of it has been in place since the 90s. And I'm being serious. I don't yeah. mean to put anybody down or anything because I know this information is a lot. It's overwhelming. You don't know where to go. You can never find it on the internet. It's crazy. I mean, I know it's very fragmented in our industry, in, in this space, in our industry. But um, you can certainly go back and visit, and let me show you guys this, because you can actually order a copy of this for free from the CDC. So this is, if you guys can see it, it is the guide. Summary? It's a summary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. So you can order this for free, and basically it gives you all of the infection prevention practices for specifically for dental settings. And in here, it'll tell you, it talks about that clutter. So you should remove all the clutter. Anything that you have on a counter, like I've been in offices doing mock inspections where they have two by twos kind of sitting in that old school container um, that's kind of open. You need to put those in a drawer. You need to put any of your air water syringe tips, suction, anything that you use in the patient's mouth needs to go into a closed container, closed cabinet, into a drawer. Kind of let, you know, not it's not sterile, but you want a better storage for it. You want it all contained because um, you want to be able to wipe off countertops. You want to be able to wipe off places. The, um, the mouthwash, I've seen a lot of those pumps with mouthwash and everything like that. Um, sometimes those are hard to store, so you can't necessarily store those in cabinets and everything like that, but maybe having a barrier over it and you pump, you know, uh, or wiping it down every time. But the whole point is you, there's a lot of aerosols that happen and all of those droplets and aerosols stay in the air and then eventually it falls. So the less clutter, the better. You guys might want to, it is recommended by the CDC to have a housekeeping cleaning schedule. So what that means is once you identify what your surface is, so we have clinical surfaces and we have housekeeping surfaces. A lot of those shelves and different stuff that hold frames of our family members and brochures from, you know, for electric toothbrushes and all that, these shelves that we put up on the walls, those are considered housekeeping surfaces, but all of that receives all that aerosol. So CDC recommends you have some type of housekeeping cleaning schedule for those surfaces because we do a great job with the clinical surfaces. It's just those surfaces house stuff sometimes that we use right in the patient's mouth. So it's good to implement that going back. Okay. That was, that was really good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So I want to go through, we've got about, about 12 minutes left. Sure. sure. And I, I really want to go through some of uh, the viewers questions. Okay. So, so um, I have Sally, she wants to know, do you think it will be mandatory for us to get the vaccine when it comes out? You know how um, we have our regulated um, yeah. inoculation. Yeah. Yeah. So OSHA only mandates the hepatitis B. So by law, you only have to get the hepatitis B unless you work for an employer that wants you to have the flu shot and other shots, right? Um, so, but the CDC does have a list of recommended immunizations for healthcare providers. Uh, I absolutely think that that is a definite possibility for us to have that vaccine just based on the nature of this virus because of the asymptomatic um, manifestation of the virus. I, I, it's totally possible. So, okay. and it was mentioned in some information that I read about what OSHA is doing behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about yet um, regarding this infectious disease standard. And they do mention a required vaccine. So okay. we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But totally good. a possibility. Uh, Miriam says, uh, do you think it's a good idea to wear a regular mask on top of N95 if you want to reuse your N95? Yes, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, it will probably help to uh, prevent contamination. It's going to be hot. I'm going to tell you guys now, for those who have never worn an N95 or higher respirator mask, if you are my age and I'm dating myself now, I'm kind of starting to go through that, you know, transition in Back life. In my I'm day. telling you, <laughs> I am telling you, these respirator masks are hot, hot, hot. So, uh, but yes, I would absolutely, if you are only given one mask or you can only get one N95 respirator mask, put a surgical mask because OSHA has written that in like some interim um, guidelines as well. So yeah, that's a great idea. Just and then be prepared. You, it's going to be hot. <laughs> it's be, I mean, I'm sure some of you guys have yeah. seen the pictures floating around of the frontline oh. healthcare workers with the bruises. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Because you have to do a fit, ta fit test. Okay. Talk everything. about that fit test India real quick, because yeah. let's say I go to the, the hardware store and I grab an N95 mask and mm -hmm. I, is that right or does it need to be fitted? So there's two types of fit tests. There's a fit test that's kind of low level fit test that's done by the user where you put on the mask, you put your hands, well, you put your hands over the mask and then you breathe in. And what that does is it kind of suctions that mask to your face. And then you keep your hands here and you go in and out and see if you can feel anything and make sure that there's a seal there, right? Okay. Right now, that's sufficient for voluntary wearers, which we are in dentistry. We can voluntarily wear an N95 and higher mask. Uh, if you are a mandated wearer, and let's say you work at a VA dental clinic, or you work at, I don't know, the prisons, or so, I don't know, because some people do work in those um, facilities that are mandated and regulated by the government, uh, those dental clinics most likely will have to go through an, a formal, official, high-level fit test. You have to be fit tested by someone who is trained to do a fit test. Uh, you put the mask on, there's a big, huge hood, there's, there's these like um, liquid chemical, li it's not a chemical, but it's liquid that's um, uh, put into the hood and then you're supposed to breathe in and see if you can breathe and smell. And so it's a whole process. So if you are a mandated where you are most likely going to be told to get um, that higher level fit test. Um, in the past, you've been able to contact your local hospital and they've offered that service to people that are in situations like us in private practice where we want to wear masks, the N95 and respirator, but I think right now during the pandemic, I'm sure they are not offering that at this moment if you're not like a frontline worker. Um, and is that so, annual? Do you, the, the once a year? Yes, is you have to get, like, if, so if you are required to have a fit test done by an authorized fit, you know, tester, then it's an, it's required annually. Um, but right now we're not mandated wearers. Now, if your employer tells you that you are a mandated wear where he or she says, I want every one of you wearing an N95 mask. The rule that's written, I don't know if they'll make you do that, but they're under, they have now put themselves under this 
mandated wear rule, it requires you to have a medical evaluation and you have to have that high level fit test and it has to be done annually. So, so okay. but most of us will probably just be voluntary. Yeah, okay, so here we go. I've got uh, Sheila. I would like to ask if we are still in the middle of the pandemic, why are we all saying that it's okay to lower the PPE recommendations? Yes, I understand there's a shortage, but what makes them think this is okay? Um, I, I see the frustration like a, in that one. Uh, yeah, I totally understand your frustration. I absolutely get it. Um, some of this has to do with politics. Some of it has to do with the economy. Uh, there's really no clear cut answer to that. Um, at the end of the day, because there's no mandates for us and a lot of things are interim, OSHA ha and the Department of Labor has put some, uh, they have put some information out there. You are now protected as a whistleblower. You are now, you can still receive unemployment if your employer does not provide the proper level of PPE. So if you personally feel like a level three mask with a face shield is not sufficient, then definitely go read. It's under the Department of Labor. You can go right to their website. You just always have to attach when you're searching COVID-19, like Department of Labor COVID-19. You'll see all of the information. Read through that. Educate yourself so that you are clear on exactly what your rights are so that if you do make that personal decision to stay home, then you're well within your rights you have, you know, the law and you have the language to back you up. And then you can competently have a conversation with your employer um, because, okay, so I live in Maryland and um, we, our governor already told us we're not, it's not, we're not going to reopen anytime soon. So he's already extended us till May 10th and thinks it might even be till June. So, um, uh, you have to make a personal decision once that mandate's up. Make sure you're well within your rights, and then you have to make a personal decision if you're going to go back. Uh, it is recommended, the CDC does recommend that if you are a healthcare provider and your workplace reopens, but you are pregnant, you are um, maybe 65 and over, or you or one of your immediate family members where you live in the home has um, compromised immune system for any, any reason that you should not return. So that is kind of left on you. Again, it's a recommendation. So I'm going to really encourage everybody on here. You want to visit CDC and search COVID-19. A lot of information there. Know what the interim guidelines are for yourself and read it for yourself. You want to visit the Department of Labor. They have a lot of information there. And then you also want to visit OSHA. Um, and not to make a plug for my company or anything, but if you go to my Instagram, our Instagram IG profile has a lot of things posted. Like I actually had them post uh, the actual mandates, like signed by governors and all that kind of stuff. And it's at learn the number two prevent. So you can see for yourself what exactly some of these organizations are saying. Um, I personally think just from what I know, you know, microbiology and all of that, we are not, I don't know that we're in the middle of it. I think we're still, I don't think we've approached the middle of this, unfortunately. So, but no, that's, that's my that's, personal you know, opinion. Since we're, we're, we're just talking about learn to prevent, if, if anybody wanted to get a hold of you, can you go ahead and tie that in? Sure, sure. Um, so if you guys have questions or anything, certainly email us. It's info at learn the number two prevent.com you can message us on facebook you can message us on ig and we try to get back to those um, within a timely manner and if you guys want we offer a monthly newsletter where we break all of this information down in bite-sized pieces so we pick one theme per month and we will break all of it down give you tips and resources uh, give you language that's you know in certain laws and recommendations so you don't have to search and so that comes out once a month and it's nice especially if maybe you're a lead dental assistant or you're the infection control coordinator in your practice it gives you information on uh, things that you can bring back to the practice or just 
for your own personal knowledge. So visit our website. It's learntoprevent.com and fill out your, uh, you know, the form and then you'll be automatically put on the list. Uh, we have the newsletter is going to come out with some more of these updates and stuff uh, for May, beginning of May. Perfect. Oh, you guys take advantage of it. Seriously. I mean, now more than ever, we need to know our stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we have three minutes. Let's, you want to do sure, lightning yeah, round? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do lightning round. I'll be short. Okay. I talk a lot. <laughs> uh, will, uh, will the Cavitron still be an option? Um, not right now. It's not recommended right now because it produces aerosol. Hand instruments okay. only. I'm the only assistant in my office. I feel like room turnover and processing instruments will require more time. How do I discuss giving me more time for room turnover to my doctor and front desk? I'm worried about being overwhelmed. Print out the CDC guidelines and the OSHA interim guidelines. There is a document that is preparing. It's called OSHA has preparing the workplace during COVID-19. Uh, print out the CDC guidelines for specifically for dental settings print them out, read through them, know what you're talking about, go in and have a conversation before you reopen call or call your doc and have a conversation with him or her regarding why you are going to need more time and here's why and have your information to support your, um, to support you advocating for more time. Yes. Be mm -hmm. your own advocate. Yes. Um, I'm going to abbreviate this one. Um, mm -hmm. Is ice flight systems a good alternative to reduce aerosols? So like... Um, I mean, there's several different brands right now. There's, yes. There's the it's isolate. better than, uh, what I'll say is it's better than nothing. Okay. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, what is the name of the free booklet? Oh, um, it's called, I'll show you. It's called the Summary of Infection Prevention in uh, Prevention Practices in Dental Settings. Perfect. Just, yep. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. What do you suggest the front desk to wear for PPE? Uh, they should wear uh, gloves. They should disinfect their whole area, including computers and all of that kind of thing. They should wear masks and um, they should limit contact with patients. Send email receipts, email treatment plans, do like digital signatures. If you're using credit card machines and all of that, they need to make sure that they are disinfecting after every use, just like the grocery stores are now. And then asking patients to stand six feet away. If you do have to take credit cards, that's why you should have the gloves on. Um, and uh, you might, they might need to change the gloves, you know, or whatever. Um, but that's what I would recommend. And, Having and people pay online. Bottoms of shoes. Um, leave your shoes at the office or in your car. I wouldn't, for, you don't really necessarily. For desk, I think this is. Oh, 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 they should leave their shoes. They should leave their. Everyone. Like, everyone should leave their shoes at the, um, you know, um, uh, front desk, depending on how your office is set up. So if your front desk is really close to operatories, then maybe they utilize wearing scrubs in the meantime and then take the scrubs off, leave everything there, you know, or launder it, whatever, like I said, for the clinicians. But if you're further away, then um, maybe leaving your shoes in the car, like having shoes dedicated for, you know, admin team, front desk, have shoes dedicated for the dental office. When you get to your car, change into your shoes that you would take into your house or something like that, or, or leave your shoes at the door. You know, a lot of people are doing that now. Leave your shoes at the door. Okay, you perfect. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and the code for today's CE is 042222201CL2P. I'll repeat 042222201CL2P. Thank you guys so much for joining. India, you're amazing. You're a magical oh, creature. You've said so many things that all of us have wanted to hear oh, from good. a reputable source that's oh, black good. and white. Like, this is exactly oh. how it affects you as the dental assistant. Oh, so, that's like, awesome. Yes. I can't thank I'm you enough. I'm excited to meet you guys. And thank you guys so much for having me. This was my very first chat with just dental assistants, so I was super excited. And so I just want to encourage you guys to stay safe protect yourselves and your family because remember you guys are important too we put a lot of emphasis on patients but dental health care providers are very important too and we need each and every one of you and so do your yes. families <laughs> yes and, and and if you guys are 
stressing about, you know, there's a lot of anxiety. It's real. And yeah. you know, yeah. someone said last week, the best cure for anxiety is education, right? Probably yes. not in those words, but it's yes. just being, when you don't know stuff, that's when you, when all the what ifs yeah. come in. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, so. Uh, but yes, thank you so much. I think somebody needs you to repeat the code. I am <laughs> typing it in the comments. Oh, right? uh, look at you. You are on now. it. <laughs> there we go. Right. And, and you guys know this will go out on DA Rockstar's podcast on Friday. So yes. if you had to dip in and out, you can listen to the whole thing and um, the code will be in there as well. Nice. So I appreciate you guys spending your hour with us and uh, keep being awesome. Yes. Bye, <laughs> oh, guys. India, somebody yes. wants to know your IG code one more time or your oh, IG at learn to prevent L E A R N the number two P R E V E N T. And that's the same thing on Facebook as well. Perfect. Okay. guys. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a great week and bye. Bye. <laughs> bye.